All right, so we are in Philippians 2 this morning. Today is what's called World Communion Sunday. Uh, It's been practiced by a lot of different churches all over the world for about the last century. Um, But before we talk about unity, I want to talk about division. Um, If there's a church that has developed a talent for dividing, it's the churches of Christ. Let's be honest. Um, We've divided over everything you can think of, as I'm sure you're aware. Microphones, PowerPoints, praise teams, which translation of the Bible to use, open versus closed communion, children's homes, missions, kitchens, potlucks, Bible classes, one cup versus many cups, leavened versus unleavened, women's roles, and more. Once, um, during a Bible class at a small church in West Texas where I used to preach, I, uh, I offered the wildest hypothetical I could come up with as a reason to divide a church. Um, we were talking about church unity. And uh, my example was, the, this hypothetical was dividing over whether or not to have a hat rack in the back of the building. And the class, straight-faced, simply replied, we divided over having a hat rack. <laughs> we are the hat rack church. We are pro hat rack. Um, we've also divided famously over instrumental music. And you can begin to see this divide in the late 19th century. At several points, it got pretty acrimonious. A guy named Richard Hughes is a a prominent Restoration Movement historian, and he records one incident. According to the the newspaper that recorded the incident, the, uh, the witnesses put it this way. After the pastor had read the opening hymn, The organist began playing, and many joined in the singing. But at the same time, the opponents of the organ started up another tune, and pandemonium ensued. After the sacrament, an anti-organ brother arose to smooth matters over with a talk, but was interrupted with a lively hymn volunteered by the organ crowd. At the close of the services, Mr. Bills, having consulted a lawyer, was advised to play the organ at all hazards. And he did so, and the meeting broke up in confusion. One thing to note, uh, though, on a, on a more serious note, is that although we tend to think of this sort of division as being rooted in deep, uh, deeply rooted theological disagreement, you know, each side has their own go-to passages from Scripture to support their side of things, the defenses from Scripture actually came after the division. In other words, people were dividing from each other for other reasons, and then they went to Scripture to hunt down any support they could find for their own side. This is a great example of proof texting and a failure to love and to listen. This, uh, this October 31st is also the 500th anniversary of of what's usually thought of as the beginning of the Reformation, the Protestant Reformation. On the last day of October, 1517, a sharp-tongued, foul-mouthed Augustinian monk and professor of theology named Martin Luther famously nailed a set of 95 arguments, 95 theses, criticisms of the abuses that were taking place in and by the church. And over the next several decades, a series of conflicts and divisions took place, ultimately leading to the division of Western Christianity into the Roman Catholic Church and into various groups of Protestants, a series of fractures that remains to this day, shaping our culture and our thought about what it means to follow Christ. And this is not to mention the ongoing fact 
that, as they say, Sunday morning is the most segregated few hours of the American week. Segregated by race, by class, by culture. With a few exceptional moments when people have gathered together to try to find common ground, with, that, with the exception of those few moments, we've put into practice our talent for dividing, for talking past each other, for seeing and hearing the worst in each other and the best in ourselves, for allowing personal grudges or long-standing prejudices to divide us, and for reading scripture solely to prop up what we already think. We've too often loved our own pet issues more than we've loved each other. And so we are always in need of the reminder that today's World Communion Sunday is meant to provide. A reminder that our calling is a communal one. That we're called not just to a personal relationship with Jesus, but to the body of Christ. That failure to love our neighbors is a failure to love Christ. That cutting myself off from my neighbor and seeking my own interest and failing to hear their cries, especially when those cries are aimed at me, doing these things while saying that I love Christ makes me a liar. And so I think it's good for us to pause on this day and celebrate what it is that binds us together. World Communion Sunday. In particular, it's meant to focus on the Lord's Supper as the place where we find our center point, the defining feature of our lives, the most real part of our week, where we're reminded that our story is not the Texas story or the American story or the Republican or the Democrat story, but Jesus' story. That our lives are pledged and given over not to the pursuit of the American dream, but to the cross of Christ. That here we find our own center, our home. There's a passage from Anne Lamott's book, Traveling Mercies, where she relays a story that she once heard from her own preacher, who was an African-American woman named Veronica. Her preacher told a story from her childhood about her best friend. She said, her best friend got lost one day when she was about seven. The little girl ran up and down the streets of the big town where they lived, but she couldn't find a single landmark. She was very frightened. Finally, a policeman stopped to help her. He put her in the passenger seat of his car and they drove around until they finally saw her church. She pointed it out to the policeman, and then she told him firmly, you can let me out now. This is my church. I can always find my way home from here. And then Anne Lamott comments on that story, saying, and that is why I have stayed so close to my church, because no matter how bad I'm feeling, how lost or lonely or frightened, when I see the faces of the people at my church and hear their tawny voices, I can always find my way home. I love that. From here, no matter how disoriented we might be from the noise and fog around us, from our shared song and our shared meal, our partaking together in the body and blood of Christ, we know who we are. We know our way home. But it also becomes clear around this table that this story is not my story. It's our story. One of the things that the Christian church has always valued about the Lord's Supper is that it's not only meant to be a regular sharing in Christ, but that by our sharing in Christ, it's also a sharing in each other, a point of contact with each other. Indeed, with Christians around the globe who will participate in this same meal, a participation with other Christians who've come before us, 
stretching back to the first century and beyond them to the Jews who celebrated God's redemptive action and love in the celebration of the Passover. In the middle of the second century, lots of rumors were circulating about the Christian community. They were dangerous. They were mysterious. They were secretive and cult-like, meeting in the dark before the sun rose on the first day of the week. They might even be cannibals, people said. And some Christians, in response to those rumors, wrote texts called apologies. Not because they regretted their Christian faith, but because they wanted to provide public defenses against the objectors and the critics and the rumors. And one of the most famous apologists was called Justin Martyr. He provides us with one of the earliest descriptions of Christian worship outside of the New Testament. And this is one of the things he says to describe Christian worship, Christian community. We who formerly de delighted in fornication now cleave only to chastity. We who exercised the magic arts now consecrate ourselves to the good and unbegotten God. We who valued above all else the acquisition of wealth and property now direct all we have to a common fund, which is shared by every needy person. We who hated and killed one another, and who because of differing customs would not share a fireside with those of another race, now after the appearance of Christ, live together with them. We pray for our enemies and try to persuade those who unjustly hate us that if they lived according to the excellent precepts of Christ, they will have a good hope of receiving the same reward as ourselves from the God who governs all. It's this facet of the Christian gathering in particular, I think, the gathering around a table that unites and that dissolves otherwise insurmountable barriers that Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians 11. Paul is really upset to the point of saying not that they need to improve the way that they're taking the Lord's Supper. No, he says what they've done is so horrific that it nullifies their practice of the Lord's Supper in Corinth altogether. What they're doing, he says, is not the Lord's Supper at all because they have used this meal not to locate their connection to their neighbors, especially their poorer neighbors in the church. Instead, they've used this meal that's meant to tear down walls of division. They've used this very meal as a means of further dividing themselves from each other. They use this meal to further prop up the walls that divide rich from poor throughout the empire of Rome. It's just been reduced to one more marker that sets the rich apart from the poor in Corinth. And Paul is having none of it. And so he responds with the letter that we call 1 Corinthians, but he does so in a surprising way. He doesn't launch into a moral sermon in reaction to the way that they're practicing communion. He doesn't list the rules they've broken. He doesn't give them a trite lesson on being nice to each other. What he does is remind them of their defining story. The proclamation that they're called to make with their mouths and their lives when they gather together to share in the body and blood of Christ. When we do this, he says, we are making a proclamation. We're proclaiming who we are and who we're not. We're pledging our allegiance and our lives to the crucified Messiah. We're offering ourselves up to him, sharing in his death. We're proclaiming that our lives, down to the marrow and bone, will be defined and framed by sharing, participating in Christ's own death to self. And this brings us to Philippians 2. This passage in Philippians 2 is called the Christ Hymn because it was very likely one of the church's earliest songs. 
And it was a declaration of the core of the Christian faith. In other words, it's an early creedal statement, which is not something we talk about much in Churches of Christ. However, we find these summaries of the Christian faith from the very start in passages like this. But notice the function of this hymn for Paul is not just to tell us about the nature of Christ and the nature of God and the nature of God's character and love, but also to draw out the connection to who we are and who we're called to be. So just as he does in 1 Corinthians 11, he tries to bring a divided community together, not with some sterile moralizing sermon, but by pointing them back to their defining story, their proclamation that their lives are cross-shaped as Christ's life was cross-shaped. And we see the same theme being fleshed out in the earliest Christian songs, songs like Philippians 2. And so what I want to do as, as I close, then, is read Paul's words. I'm not going to comment on them afterwards. I simply want us to hear, to attend to this connection that Paul is making between the way that we think about and see who God is when we see Christ crucified and who we are as those who share in his body and blood around this table. So I'm going to read it slowly and invite all of us to listen with open ears and minds and hearts. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, Make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Amen.